Well, first and foremost, it tells us that JWST is performing better than the specifications. Uh, the images are incredibly sharp. They're really sensitive. And uh, we're seeing not only things in the foreground, but all of these background galaxies. Um, and so it's telling us that web is going to be a tremendous tool for discovering lots of things about our universe. Um, the images themselves contain some really cool information about things that are going on both uh, relatively close to um, our own solar system and then things that are billions of light years away. And what we know that the Hubble and then the web now, um, they're quite different. Can you explain some of the differences that we're seeing? Sure. Hubble is, uh, they're both space telescopes. Hubble is an optical telescope. It, it sees mostly in the the range of uh, the human eye in terms of colors or wavelengths. Uh, Webb, on the other hand, uh, goes from the sort of red part of what we would see, think of as the visible spectrum way out into the infrared, where light is, uh, we think of it as heat rather than light, but it's really light. It just has longer wavelengths than what our human eye can see. And that allows us um, not only to penetrate dust uh, in um, young stars uh, in nearby in our galaxy. It also allows us to see galaxies that are so far away that as they're caught in the flow of the expanding universe, their light is being stretched out into the infrared, uh, red shifted. And <clears throat> Hubble can't see those galaxies, uh, Webb can see them. So um, Webb, I like to say, is kind of a triple crown in terms of Extraordinary sensitivity, very, very faint objects. It, it could detect the heat of a bumblebee at the distance of the moon, for example. Um, very, very sharp images. It could uh, image a penny uh, at a distance of 25 miles away. And then this broad range of wavelengths of light. And this might be a strange question, but I think the general public would like to know also is, when we're looking at these images, often they kind of look like what you would see in a kaleidoscope. You're just looking at a bunch of light everywhere. How do we, how are we able to distinguish that one thing is a star versus something else being something different? So um, in the foreground of most of the images are things that, you know, we can easily recognize this is a galaxy or um, in one case, it's sort of this egg-shaped nebula of material that's being pushed out from, from two stars. You can actually see the stars in the center of it. Um, for the more distant, the smaller things in the image, almost all of those are galaxies. And um, you can tell that in two ways. Um, some of them you can actually see that they're shaped like a little spiral or like a kind of an oval shape, so they're not a star. And then for the ones that are really, really distant, that um, you know, really just, okay, is that a star or a galaxy? You can actually measure what's called the spectrum and see that the, the light from it is being shifted so far into the red or the infrared that we know that this is very, very far away. And in order to see something that far away, it can't be a single star. It's gotta be a whole galaxy of stars. So that's kind of the way you can distinguish between them. And I've seen the images coming out and was there four galaxies or is there five? So there's one image um, which is called Stefan's Quintet. And that is a collection of five galaxies. Uh, one of those galaxies, the one on the left is actually not associated with the other four. It's closer to us, it's in the foreground. But the other four are actually interacting and colliding with each other. And the middle one, if you look carefully, there are actually two galaxies that are very close to each other and they're kind of tearing each other apart as they move through each other. And so it's a really violent, um, we're catching sort of a glimpse of a very violent set of interactions between these um, systems of, of billions and billions of stars, uh, which in tearing each other apart are actually creating new stars as they do it. That's really interesting, the creating the new star aspect. Would you yeah. relate that to something similar as like a fire burning? As it goes out, there's a small ember that could kind of spark a new fire if it was lifted out. Yeah, that's one way to think of it. Another is to think of it as um, 
these things are as the stars within each galaxy are interacting with each other and tugging on each other gravitationally, they're pulling material out uh, in um, a kind of a, a streamer, if you will. And, and that streamer of material, um, almost like a firework, I suppose, um, stars are being formed within that streamer. Very cool. I saw one image that almost looks like um like a gaseous image. Is is that actual kind of a gas looking um, foreground with the stars behind it? Can you explain that one? Yeah. So that's the one that looks sort of uh, this brownish, smoky stuff at the bottom, and then the blue at the top. So that's part of what's called the Carina Nebula. Um, it's um, a few thousand light years from the from the Earth, and um, it is a place where stars are being born in our own galaxy. So two things are happening. Um, in the bottom of the image where you see all of that dust, that brown material, um, that is part of the raw material of star formation. Stars are being formed there. But in the upper part, which is clear, stars that have already formed, uh, massive stars, much more massive than the sun, have started eroding away that brown material. They're emitting what are called stellar winds and also a, a large amount of ultraviolet light, what we try to protect ourselves from when we go to the beach. Um, and that is eroding away the edge of the star forming region. And so it's kind of a battle between making new stars at the bottom of the image and tearing that material away at the top. That's very interesting. Another question in terms of, um, I hear we could find other information while looking through this. Could we find information in terms of chemicals on certain planets, uh, potentially water? Yes. Like so one of the things that Webb is designed to do is to make what we call spectra of uh, objects in the universe, everything from galaxies to individual planets around other stars. and. A spectrum is simply a way of displaying um, the peaks and valleys of the light as a function of wavelength. Those peaks and valleys are fingerprints of the chemistry of whatever it is you're looking at. Uh, there's a very characteristic uh, set of peaks and valleys for uh, different elements, for molecules, the composites of elements. And so by making spectra of planets around other stars, for example, uh, JWST can tell us what the composition of the atmosphere of that planet is. Does it contain water? Does it contain carbon dioxide? Does it even have an atmosphere? And that would tell us whether that planet, you know, potentially could support life. It won't tell us whether there is life, but whether it could support life. That's actually a tricky thing to do because planets orbiting close to their parent stars are very, very dim compared to the, the star. And so JWST has to use some tricks in order to be able to pull the light of that planet out from the star. But um, there are a number of ways to do that. And uh, one of the images that came out uh, was of a spectrum of a, a planet around a nearby star showing the features of water in the atmosphere. How exciting is that to be able to, to find maybe potential to have life on another, another planet, I mean, in your field? It's very exciting. It's actually an area that I'm personally interested in and that I'll be um, participating in some of the later data that will come back from planets around other stars. For um, a long time, um, well, go back to 1600 when Giordano Bruno said there must be uh, innumerable stars and innumerable planets around those stars, but we just can't see them because the planets are too dim. Uh, astronomers have wanted to see planets around other stars, and, and that became possible only in the 1990s. But uh, the telescopes that we had at the time could tell us that, yeah, there's a planet there, but it couldn't really tell us what the atmosphere was made of. And with Hubble and uh, another observatory called Spitzer, the very first tentative indications of atmospheres around the biggest planets uh, became, it became possible to detect those. Now with Webb, we can do that with planets that are down almost to the size of the Earth, not just giant planets, but planets that more closely resemble our own home world. 
That's very fascinating. It's just that extra step forward from Hubble that I feel like we we haven't seen yet and is much needed. Just last question for you. I know you have to get running here, but um, what's the next step in getting an even better and closer look at these galaxies? So the next step, you know, these are only a half a dozen or a dozen images, depending on how you count them. And uh, astronomers from around the world have scheduled time on web and will be collecting data. Many of those data sets are going to be even more sensitive than these images. So that image of distant galaxies, for example, was not the deepest that Webb can go. It was actually a relatively short exposure. So astronomers are going to be pushing the envelope with JWST now with their own observations. And so for the next 10 years, there'll be lots of new discoveries from this remarkable observatory.